Welcome to Christianity University. Christianity 101. Albert Einstein said that things should be explained as simple as possible, but not simpler. And that's what we hope to do in this. So let's get started. Christianity 101. Jesus said there was a certain rich man. This was not a parable. This was something that he said there was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Doesn't sound too, too good. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And notice, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, torments plural, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And notice what Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. There's no going back and forth, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, the rich man said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Could someone go to them and warn them? Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, oh, they would repent. If somebody came to them and spooked them from the grave, they'd get the message. But notice what Abraham said. He said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And so when we begin this today, we hope that you will agree with us that the last thing we wish for is to end up like this rich man, desiring to alert his five brothers of this place of torment where he was and powerless to help them. Right now is the time you are to be congratulated for looking into this today, now, while you are alive. Now is the time to ponder such things as heaven and hell. And if you choose to believe this is simply a fairy tale or not true, that's totally up to you, but at least you'll understand the nuts and bolts of heaven, hell, as it is portrayed in the scripture, life and death, and you can make intelligent decisions based upon the knowledge that you have. And so we begin today with Christianity 101. The first part of this is, why? Do we need a Savior? Why do we need a Savior? And the mechanics of life and death. The world gives the picture of a funnel. All are headed to heaven. We're all Christians. This is a Christian nation. Everyone is on their way to heaven. Read the obituary. It's automatic. You never hear so-and-so split hell wide open. No, they're all in a better place now. It's 
their suffering is over. She's finally at peace. People are so confident that all is well. But what is the truth? What are the facts? Could it possibly be that people are in denial? Where do people go when they die? Most everyone believes in a heaven, but is there a hell? If the newspaper is to be believed, hell would be empty. But what does the Bible say? If there's a hell, why? Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So, let's look at this right. Let's turn the funnel over. The origin of evil. Now it would be easy to spend an hour on this subject alone, but very quickly let's just look at a few things. Notice this. The scripture says in the book of Isaiah, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, or I, I supported thee, I helped you even though you didn't know me. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. Notice verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, don't let that surprise you. Maybe you thought the devil created evil. But God lays claim to it. Instead of passing the buck, God declares plainly that he is the creator of evil. How can that be? It's because all power, all power, comes from God. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, think about that for a moment. If this were not so, the world would be in a heap worse mess being hijacked by evil powers. But when we know that there is no power but that which comes from God, then everything begins to make sense. Let's look at it based upon the scripture. So God created evil. Why did God create evil? Again, this is a subject that could take an hour. But let's consider a few facts. Let's consider some things. In the creation of good, there is the opposite. There is light, there is darkness. There is right, there is wrong. There is up, there is down. You can go left, you can go right. So there is good, there is evil. A dog can wag his tail and be a good dog, or he can chew the slipper and be a bad dog. That is the nature of the world we live in. So, there is right, there is wrong. There is good, there is evil. Sin, or iniquity, is the choice to do evil. Sin is any transgression against the commandment of God. It means to miss, to miss the way, to go wrong, to incur guilt, to forfeit. 
the person who wins the gold but then comes out that he he took steroids or he or he cheated he must forfeit the gold it, he he must give it back to miss the goal or path of right or duty to incur guilt to incur penalty by sin to forfeit to bear loss to wander from the way in some place in the cosmos the time in which no mortal can tell there was rebellion or sin in heaven how art thou fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations for thou hast said in thy heart I will ascend unto the heavens I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will be like the Most High remember God said there's none like him Lucifer said I will be like the Most High Ooh, rebellion rebellion in heaven that's right and by this angel Lucifer which means son of the morning the light of the morning and notice verse 15 the Lord said yet thou shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit here is a description of this angelic being this these angels eyewitnesses to the power and the majesty of God led by the most beautiful angel of all Lucifer thou hast been in Eden the garden of God every precious stone was thy covering and then it describes this in some incredible array of beauty thou art the anointed cherub that covereth and I have set thee so I gave thee this responsibility thou wast upon the mountain of God thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee and so God created a place for the disobedient the angels that sinned or forfeited their place in heaven the angels who wandered from the way and the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day then shall he say also unto them on his left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for who the devil and his angels no more will Lucifer be called son of the morning no longer will he be called the light no instead he will be called the devil which means slanderer or false accuser he will be called Satan which means adversary or enemy and the devil the slanderer that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever in just a moment we're going to be studying the difference between hell and the lake of fire it's important to understand these things and it's also important to understand the mechanics of death and what death really is for us to truly understand life 
we must also understand death. Enter man. Before Lucifer goes to his place of torment, God in his infinite wisdom allows him to serve a purpose upon this earth. He wanted to be equal with God. He will now become the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. He will have many titles, devil, slanderer, or accuser, tempter, and the sifter. He's going to be the sifter of the hearts of man, of this creation of God. He will play a role in testing the will of man upon earth to turn man away from God as he himself rebelled when and wherever possible. Man, not an angelic being that witnessed the power and the majesty of creation, but instead human beings created in flesh and blood, placed in a world that caters to the flesh with a nature to sin. God would prove to these disobedient angels, the ones destined to burn in a lake of fire and brimstone, that although the heart of man is deceitfully wicked, there would be those who would choose what is right. Lucifer would lose his place and there would be a spiritual warfare. Satan becomes the adversary or the enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. He's not the prince of light. He's the prince of darkness. Against spiritual wickedness, in high places and in many years from this time the Lord would say to Simon to Peter Simon behold Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not and when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren we will see this take place. If it was possible to look into the spirit world and to see this drama unfolding before our very eyes, it is possible when we look into the book of Job. There in the book of Job, we see God, we see Satan, and we see this man by the name of Job. Let's peer in, in from the vantage point of the spirit world. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God, and eschewed evil. That word eschewed means he rebelled against evil. He did something about evil. And there's an old saying, all it takes for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing. Job was a good man that did something in this world to combat the evil that was in the world. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, saying, Oh, going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Yes, Satan, you're the, you're the God of the world. You're the prince of the world. And here is a man that is walking perfect. Do you see him? 
Have you noticed him? What does Satan say? He said, Doth Job fear God for naught? He only fears you for what he gets out of it. Why, if you didn't give him all the things you do, you just watch him curse you. Hast thou not made a hedge about him while you protected him, and about his house and all that he hath on every side? You blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And notice, notice what happens. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Remember, all power comes from God. Satan only had the power that God allowed him to have. And he, he limited it right here. He said, Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. Take everything that he's got, but don't touch his body. And that's exactly what took place. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. All power comes from God. Here we see the spiritual warfare. We see what happens behind the scenes. God, Satan, and man. Back to Genesis and the creation of man. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. God placed in man a soul, the real part of man that will live forever somewhere. Not the body, but the soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice that there is the tree of life and there is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And notice this. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man. He didn't recommend. He did not suggest. But he commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, you might die. No, he said, Thou shalt surely die. We have to look at this carefully. God creates man made of flesh, places him in a garden where exist besides the trees pleasant to the sight and good for food is the tree of life everything that adam needs to live forever and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil god gives just one commandment don't eat of that one tree the day that you choose to disobey god you will forfeit your place you will die. And in a moment we're going to see that death is separation. Death is separation. Adam, you too will go the way of the angels that sinned if you disobey God. And then also in the garden is that tree of life, the tree of that would allow Adam to live forever. So right here we see life and death. We notice 
God said, not maybe, not possibly, but he said, ye shall surely die. One commandment, and that was one that needed to be taken seriously. And so Satan, the deceiver, begins his work upon human flesh. Now the serpent was more subtle or sneaky or sly than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Oh, let's examine God's word. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Notice what the woman said. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Mm-hmm. Is that what God said? We know that's not what God said. He distinctly said, Thou shalt surely die. Not lest, not perchance, not maybe. Somehow Eve missed what God said. Now notice, the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Oh, what a slanderer. He's calling God a liar. That's what the word devil means. Slanderer, accuser. Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now what he does is he mixes truth with lies. Someone told me many years ago, there's only one thing worse than finding a worm in your apple, and that's finding half a worm. That means you ate the other half. And there's only one thing worse than a, than a lie, and that's a half a lie. And so he causes Eve to question God's word by mixing truth and lie. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Well, Satan succeeded in getting this man to sin. Now man, as the angels that sinned, must also pay the penalty for sin. Man must forfeit. Man must die. God said it. And if God's word is true, it must come to pass. Before we move on, though, let's see some things about this scripture that are very interesting. Notice that the Bible says, that she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Notice what the Apostle John wrote in his first epistle. He said, to love not the world, referring to the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For that all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These three doors, these are the three portals to the soul. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When the woman saw that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, and good for food, she took of it. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of 
God abideth forever. These are the three portals into the soul. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The first thing that they did was to try to hide their shame. Man has been doing the very thing ever since. But of course, to hide from God did not work. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Man tries to hide from God, but notice, And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? God scans the horizon, and the eyes of the Lord like laser beams searched until they found their hiding place. In the book of Hebrews, we read that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner, a judge is able to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And notice, neither is there any creature that is not manifest or, or uncovered in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded? Remember, not recommended, but commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat. His sin found him out. He could not hide it. And notice, the man said, the woman, do I, do I sense some buck passing here? Do I hear some alibi here? The woman whom thou, oh God, God is implicated here. The woman whom thou, God, if you hadn't given me this woman, this never would have happened. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the devil made me do it. No, she said, the serpent beguiled me. He tricked me, deceived me, and I did eat. Of course he deceived her. That's his job. That is his occupation. He is the deceiver. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And the next scripture is very, very important. And I will put enmity, which means hatred or hostility, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is very important, because here we see what is called the first messianic prophecy, the first prophecy that foretells the coming of the Messiah or the Redeemer that will redeem mankind back to God because of the penalty 
of sin, which is death. It's very important. And here we see the beginning of the spiritual warfare between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. It's very important that we focus upon this scripture. Then the scripture says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Interesting. Notice that the fig leaves didn't suffice. Why? It's because something had to die. In order to provide an adequate covering, something had to die. This right here is the first of many types and shadows of the atonement. Atonement means to satisfy the penalty of sin. Something had to die. And we're going to see many types and shadows of what it's going to take to redeem mankind back from the penalty of sin, which is death. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. Part of what the devil said was true. But now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, which was a type of angel, the very type of angel that Lucifer was, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So man loses his right. He forfeits his right to the tree of life. He forfeits his place in the garden. He is thrust out of the garden of Eden. Now the question is, did they die that day as God said they would? Or was Satan right? Did God lie? Is God's word true? Adam died a spiritual death. He died a physical death many years later. Adam actually lived to be 930 years. But that day he died a spiritual death. And we will see that the spiritual death is much, much more severe than the physical death. We're going to see this. Adam did die a spiritual death. He was separated from God. But the good news is that God gave to Adam and to his offspring the promise that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. We will see that the seed of the woman will have victory over the devil. If we look into the future from these events, we see a baby born in a manger in Bethlehem. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, it's important to realize the scripture also tells us that the Messiah would come through the lineage of David, who was king of Israel. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he 
shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Prophet Isaiah prophesied, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Yes, God wrapped himself in human flesh and took upon himself the penalty of sin. The great creator became our savior. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest or made in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, which also includes the fallen angels. They saw God wrap himself in human flesh. Preached unto the Gentiles, which are the non-Jews. We'll be discussing that in future studies. Believed on in the world and received up into glory. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments or the order of things of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, or the identity of God, bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Remember, all power comes from God. And he is the head of all principality and power, wrapped in human flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You and your word are the same. A person's word cannot be separated from them. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 10 says that he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, which is the Jewish nation. We will, we will discuss all of that in future studies. And his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, the one who made peace and created evil, who is the head of all principality and power, wrapped himself in human flesh so he could take upon himself the penalty of sin for Adam, and not for Adam only, but for every soul that would be born into this world. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. All of this took place 
in the foreknowledge of God before the foundation of the world, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel being the good news, we will study this in detail in future studies. We were all born in sin and on our way to death. But now we have to understand we're not just referring to the physical death. We're talking about a spiritual death or a second death. There are two deaths and there are two resurrections. Let's look at it. These are the nuts and bolts of life and death. Let's look at this. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of, what? The second death. Notice that. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. If there's a first resurrection, there's also a second resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. What is the second death? The lake of fire. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. We must take note of this. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, there are two deaths, spiritual and physical, and there are two resurrections. There is the resurrection unto life, and there is the resurrection unto nation. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were over. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and, and, of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Verily, verily, notice what Jesus said. And every time he says, verily, verily, we really need to listen. He said, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Marvel not. Many times in Scripture, Jesus says, verily, verily, and many times he finishes it up with marvel not or don't don't let this blow your mind marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation the resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. We are all born under the curse and the penalty of sin, which is the second death. The Savior gives us the chance to escape the horror of the, the spiritual death, the second death. Let's look at this. First, we see our life. We are born, all of us, born under the curse of sin. The penalty of sin is death. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is a heaven where is eternal life. And there is the second death, which is the lake of fire, which is eternal separation from God. When a person dies that 
has obeyed the gospel, that because of the gospel, they might die a physical death. But the physical death in the eyes of God is a zero because God will resurrect them from that physical death. And then they go to a place where Lazarus was in paradise with Abraham. Luke 16. They go to a place called paradise. What is he doing there? He is waiting for the first resurrection. And he goes to the resurrection of life, which is the first resurrection, and he goes to heaven. Whereas the rich man died, physically he died, and what did he do? He went to hell. Hell is a holding place. Hell would be the same as the county jail. And there in the county jail he waits until his sentence. And then the second resurrection, and it's the resurrection of damnation. And from there he goes to the judgment seat of God, the white throne judgment. And from there, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Why do we need a Savior? We need a Savior because we are all born under the curse of sin. The penalty of sin is death. And the Savior has given us the chance to escape the second death. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Thank God we have a Savior. The next portion of this study, we will see exactly how did the Savior save us and what exactly did Jesus do for us. You have finished Christianity 101. Now it's time to proceed to Christianity 102. How did the Savior save us? What exactly did Jesus do for us? May God bless you richly in Jesus' name.